hello again and this is the last Canadian whiskey that I should be having in this challenge and we'll see what this, this one's like and then I'll give you a bit of a roundup on how I felt Canadian whiskey because it's actually oh I've got a cups excuse me it's actually been quite interesting doing these Canadian ones but not necessarily eye-opening but it surprised me a little bit so this particular one uh, was a donation from uh, somebody who doesn't wish to be named um, but it's not Mr X and it's not Mr. Z, who was the other one. It's Mr. Y. Why? I don't know why he doesn't want to, to be known who it is, but thank you very much for the sample nonetheless. Um, so this is um, Glen Breton, um, which is for, by a company called Glenora Distillers. And they were launched in um, 1990 by a guy called Bruce Jardine. And it's um, based in uh, Cape Breton Island. Uh, which is in Nova Scotia. And looking on the map, I think it's pretty much the closest distillery in North America to the UK. Um, now, Cape, Cape Breton Island has a geography and a geology quite similar to Scotland. Um, it's quite rugged and um, it's very evocative of, of sort of Scottish highlands. And Bruce was a guy that, that had a vision of, of opening a distillery and essentially emulating Scotch whiskey. So that's partly the reason for the name of Glen Breton. Um, he actually um, contacted Bemore on Isla uh, and they helped him and gave him some guidance in terms of setting up the distillery and the production and also sourcing. I don't know whether the still and the mashton is from them or at least they at the very least helped him source them, but they were quite influential in him setting up the distillery. Um, so it's um, they've got a bottling facility. It's a very small company still even now. There's only about 30, 35 people that work there. But they've got a bottling, bottling, uh, a what? A bottling facility on site, uh, and they also have an inn, so tourists can come visit the distillery, but also stay for a break. Now, in 2012, the Scotch Whiskey Association actually tried to force them to stop using the name Glen. Um, Glen Breton is is the Glenora is the name of the company, but Glen Breton is the name of their range of Scotch whiskies, and they were actually, according to them, the first uh, North American distillery to do a single malt because. Bruce was wanting to pay homage to Scotch whiskey. You could say rip them off, take advantage of them, however you want to do it. And that's certainly what the Scotch Whiskey Association was, were trying to do. For several years, they've been trying to stop anyone outside Scotland implying by the use of name or marketing that they are linked with Scotch. And they've, they've um, done this in India particularly. A lot of Indian uh, whiskies. I think recently it was Bagpiper. Um, which I have had as part of the challenge, not really memorable, um, but they apparently have managed to force Bagpiper, which I think is owned by Diageo, to not be called Bagpiper and not have the image of the Bagpiper on the label outside of India. Um, that was essentially the deal, was outside of India, there won't be. there's another one, um, I think it's McDowell's as well, because it's a Muck name, it can't be called McDowell's anymore, because as with things in the EU, and we've had all this malarkey and nonsense about Brexit in terms of the EU, what you're not allowed to do, call it a Cornish pasty unless it's from Cornwall, that sort of thing. Um, and it's a very similar thing in that the Scotch Whiskey Association is trying to almost protect Scotch whiskey by not having other countries or other markets intruding on them by pre pretending they're Scotch. But the Canadian Supreme Court dismissed it and they've been able to carry on calling it Glen Breton. So um, Bruce Jardine sadly died in 1999 um, and in 96 um, it was taken over by uh, by another company who are running it now. I can't remember the name of the guy that runs it. Um, what I don't know is whether the reason that it was sold in 96 was kind of Bruce or family or whatever it was kind of clear that he wasn't going to be able to carry on. That I don't know. That's just conjecture on my part. It could be completely wrong. So, um, sorry, it wasn't 96, it was 94 uh, that they took it over. So, uh, Glen Breton, um, a range of single malt whiskies, various ages and anniversaries and things like that. But they also have an unusual range, which was suggested to them by some of their customers to do the Glen Breton Ice. Now, what they've done with this is there is a... Um, company in Nova Scotia called Juiced or Juiced Vineyards and they are taking their whiskey and finishing it off in barrels that have previously held ice wine 
from this company. Now, um, ice wine is a, is a dessert wine, but it's quite a distinctive type of dessert wine. Uh, dessert wine normally with uh, grapes, and you, you may have heard of something called noble noble rot or botrytis, where basically the grapes are left on the vine past the point that they would have been picked ordinarily when they're nice and healthy and fat and juicy. And they then begin to disintegrate and essentially rot. And what happens is all the sugars within the, the grape concentrate and as it kind of shrinks and, and if you look at a, a bunch of grapes if you google a picture of noble rot and you look at a picture of grapes it looks horrible because everything's withered and they're not quite raisins because it's not been dried out but it's withered and horrible and wrinkly and small and it was like well you throw that in the bin but if you crush them the juice that you get out of them to make wine is really concentrated with sugar and it makes quite a rich dessert wine now if you freeze grapes that are at the point of being very healthy, it essentially does the same thing, but it doesn't have this rotting element. It freezes the grapes and it freezes, the, sh the sugars don't freeze, but the, the water inside them does. So that freezes and crystallizes, but the sugars stay concentrated. So if you pick it at the right time, and this is why ice wine tends to be quite expensive and quite hard to get hold of, because essentially you need your grapes at their peak point to then frost so there's no guarantee that you're gonna get a frost in your vineyards. So you can't guarantee this is gonna happen every year, but it's more likely to happen in the Northern Hemisphere, such as Canada. Um, and Germany's quite big on ice vine as well. Um, so you need, you need the frost, and then you need the people to get out there and pick them as quickly as they can while it's still frosted, while it's still frozen. You need to get out in your vineyards, pick it and crush it as quickly as you can to get this really concentrated, but what you tend to find with ice wine is you also get a crisp, clean acidity to it as well. Whereas Botrytis and Noble Rot um, dessert wines tend to be very rich and unctuous and, and sugary sweet. Whereas ice wine is very sweet, but it's also got quite an acidic flavor to it as well. So really unusual wine and then really unusual to a mature whiskey in barrels that have previously held it. So this is a 10 year old. They now this was only available, and this is what the bottle looked like, because this was only available in a 25 mil bottle. But I have found the 12 year old, which is a 70 CL bottle or 75, whichever one it is, at 48 quid. But I don't think the 10 year old is available anymore because I think they've got older versions of it. I believe this was the first one that they did. So that was a 25 CL bottle. In terms of price, I don't know, but you can find the 12 year old at about 50 quid a bottle. Uh, Master Malt was selling that probably cheaper in uh, in Canada and, and the US, I would guess. Um, so the, the 10 year old is released at cast strength, so it's 57, 57.2%. Um, and it's finished in, uh, in these ice wine barrels for four months. So it's not matured for too long. It's not there for the full 10 years. Um, I think it's bourbon barrels that they use for their general maturation. So I have been told that this is very distinctive and very unusual, but I'm very, very intrigued to see what this is like, because I do like my whiskies that try something different. Even if it doesn't necessarily work, at least they've had a go. So, Mr. Y, thank you very much for this. I'm very much looking forward to this. I have some water, just in case. It'd be interesting to see whether it needs it. Well, Okay, I have to say, the nose is not the most attractive thing I have ever smelt in my life. It's getting the back of my nose, but that's the alcohol. But... Okay, there is a grapiness to it, actually. And it's like a grape skins. But there's a musty character to it as well. There is a sweetness to it, and it's a re oh god, what's this now? What is this sweetness that's hiding at the back? Strawberry laces. There is an element of, um, you know, strawberry laces, so the jellied strawberry sweet that you tend to get rolled up, or in bags where they'd be like individual strands that take right. that, but this strawberry jelliness, as well as white grape skins and then this slightly weird musty farmyardy character 
and I'll be honest, there's a little bit of an element of, um, and this is only because I've had to deal with them recently, even though she's potty trained, she's still wearing nappies at night. My daughter's nappies in the morning, if she's had a wee during the night in her sleep, all that together. So there's a couple of nice aromas in it and then a couple of really weird ones and not that, well, your own daughter, or your, your own child's nappies don't smell awful. They don't smell as awful as another child's nappies do. And it's almost pleasant, almost because it's from your child, but at the same time, it's still not pleasant because it's wee and it's a wee filled nappy. But this is that borderline where it's a slightly unpleasant smell as well as not that bad a smell. But yeah, strawberry laces, definitely. That's the sweet that I can smell in that. <clears throat> Good blimey. Now, fortunately, it doesn't taste of wee nappies. Not that I have tasted my daughter's wee filled nappies. But it's not as odd as the nose is on the palate. It's not as weird. To be honest, it's 57.3, but it's not overly powerful in terms of the alcohol. There's an effervescence to it. The, the Caden heads that I've just had was 58.3, and straight away I knew I needed to add some water. This doesn't necessarily need it. There's quite a nice sweetness to it. There's a sherbetiness to it, but it's not the lemon sherbet of the potters that I've just tried. It's more of a sweet sherbet, like a generic sherbet. The sherbet that you get inside of flying saucers not quite as tingly as that type of sherbet, but that sweetness. It's interesting. It's nowhere near as sweet as I thought it was going to be. There's almost a slight peatiness to it as well. There's a very soft peatiness that kind of reminds me a little bit of Bunnerhaven. Certainly doesn't taste like 57.2% ABV. I'm gonna add some water, but it's borderline as to whether it needs it or not. It's very scotchy though, you know, it's a single malt, and I don't know whether they use peat. I'm guessing if they've got ties with Bermot, they may well be, because there is a really soft, gentle peatiness to it, and it works quite well. What gets me is the fact that the nose was so weird and the palette is almost disappointingly straightforward. I mean, I was expecting something more unusual. Let's try it in some water, just to see if that makes any difference. Because it just, I'm, want, I'm waiting for something weird to come through with it, but it's not. It's actually like a very nice, soft, gentle Isla. Let's put some water in and see how we go. Maybe that might loosen things up and get something else that's hiding in the background. See, the strawberry laces have gone now, and it's, it's a little bit more earthy, but it's still not powerful. It's, it's, not, it's not as intense as it was before, and it's not as interesting. It's just dulled everything a little bit. The sweetness is there, but it's, that musty character is way off in the background now. I'm going to add a couple more drops. There's not a great deal left, as you can probably see. But that didn't really seem to do much on the palate for the for the, the, the burn. But it, it's not really a burn. It just it still feels like it's masking something. I've put a couple more drops in just for that last bit. There is sweetness to it. There's not really much of a grapiness. There is a bit of strawberry now coming through on the palate. Strawberry, um, strawberry sweets. Um, like strawberry jelly sweets are coming through. Not obvious, but it's kind of there in the background. Let's give this one more go. Weird, because I've added more, I've added a couple of drops of water just for that last little bit. And it kept the alcohol 
fizziness, effervescence if you want. And the more water I've added, it's almost as though it's kept all the ABV and just stripped away all the flavour. Because it's, it's as effervescent as it was on the first mouthful with no water, as it was just then. And yet the flavour that was in the, the first mouthful to the second, where this strawberry kicked through, now there's a little bit of strawberry on the aftertaste, but it's, it's barely there. There's an odd sweetness to it. It's, I'm a little bit disappointed by it, simply because I was hoping it was going to be weirder than it is. It's more mainstream than I was expect than than I wanted almost. This strawberry element is quite interesting, and I think maybe I just haven't got the water balance right in terms of adding water to it, because that that strawberry element's interesting. And makes it stand out but that's really all there is to it it's otherwise it's like a a very very lightly peated soft isla a soft sweet isla i can't stop thinking about bun when i'm drinking it yeah i'm mm, i'm disappointed by it because i was hoping for a lot more weirdness to it because of the story behind it because of what it's being finished off in and it's almost like it needs more in that cask. It, it's down as four months in um, in these barrels. Six months, a year, 12 months would be, I, I think would be more interesting, to be honest. But it's interesting to try. That, Mr. White, thank you very much for that. That is Canadian done. And Canadian has been interesting. Canadian really has been at two camps. There's been the cheap lower end where it's Canadian Club and Crown Royal, Canadian Mist and like Macadams and, and things like that where it seems to be made to be mixed. Canadian whiskey more than anything seems to be, the cheap end seems to be made to be mixed. Not to be drunk neat, you mix it, you put it in cocktails, you drink it with coat, you put it on the rocks, whatever. And therefore to drink neat, not great because there's not a great deal there. It's just enough to kind of blend with everything else. But the good stuff has been really good. Lot 40, fantastic. Potter's, really unusual. This is good, don't get me wrong. The Glen Breton Ice is a good whiskey. And I think I've got my hopes up too much. And I think if I came into it, if I come back to it later on, maybe next year, or if I had tried it without knowing the backstory behind it, or tried it blind, I think I'd prefer it a lot more. I think I'd be more enthusiastic about it. Not that I'd prefer it more, but I'd be more enthusiastic about it. So, Canadian whiskey is good. Canadian whiskey has a bad reputation. It struggles against American. It doesn't even get anywhere near Scotch in terms of popularity or things like that. And Canadian seems to be straddling two camps of either being a very, very popular, going for the mixing market and accepting the fact that, well, okay, our whiskey's not that brilliant, but it's cheap and it's good in cocktails. Or this other camp that's going, do you know what? You know, Canada can stand on its own two feet. You know, yes, we're treated as America's younger brother, but actually, do you know what? We've got personality of our own. We've got, we've got in integrity. We've got intelligence. We've got passion. We're going to make some really good whiskies. And the ones that are really giving it a go, like, you know, the Lot 40 was fantastic. That this Potters was good. What, what was the other one? Oop, sorry, what was the other one I had that was really, really good? Uh, Oh, come on, where are you, you stupid thing? Gibson's Finest, good room and works. You know, some absolute crackers. Really, really good whiskey that competes with some of the best whiskies that I've had through this challenge. And has an individuality. Is, is, is able to stand up and go, do you know what, we're Canadian. We're kind of rye heavy because Canada is a country suited for growing rye rather than barley and corn and things like that. It's just let down, I think, by the lower end of the market. The lower end of Canadian isn't as good as the lower end of particularly American, which has impressed me with the cheaper ones. Now, it's not long before I start going into my run of blends. In fact, I've got two grains, and then I'm going to be going into my run of Scotch blends. And it'll be very interesting to see how they stand out in terms of they're the cheap end of Scotch whiskey. Are they as good generally can I be as positive about them as I can about the, I was positive about the bottom end of American whiskey. The cheap, you know, bottom shelf, shall we say, American whiskey is still not good, but drinkable and decent. And bottom shelf Canadian, not great, really lets it down. But top shelf Canadian is up there with top shelf American and top shelf Scotch. 
So it's been very, very interesting to try these Canadian whiskies. I'm very interested to go out and try some more Canadian. I, I will be looking for it when I finish the challenge and go shopping um, because I think it d deserves a lot more um, positivity than I think it gets as a market. I think it's, it's great stuff. Um, so um, if you do, if you are interested in Canadian whiskies and Canadians, um, I recommend Whiskey Whistle um, watching his videos because he is a Canadian, he's living in Seoul admittedly, um, but he will be able to give you more information about Canadian whiskies. And um, as I suspected, um, Jamie and Mark who do the um, Whiskey Topic podcast, they are Canadian as well, um, but they're not married. I didn't think they were, but you know, I thought I'd, uh, I thought I'd double check. So, right, then we're on to Scotch Grain. Only two of them, uh, two grain whiskies, and then we're gonna go on to a nice little run of Scotch blended whiskey. So, this could be interesting. I shall see you then. Cheers.